Welcome back, everyone. So for this uh, session, we're going back um, to, for our third stopping point in the historic avant-garde, and we're going to talk about Dada in Paris. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you just a, a, a general overview of Dada, which was far bigger than Paris, um, especially sort of its ideological uh, underpinnings. That'll be important to know. And then I'm going to give you some examples of their participatory um, engagements with, with the public, um, which you're going to see is distinct from futurism in some ways, but also compatible uh, and maybe a little more distinct from the, the Russian avant-garde. So I think one of the big takeaways for, for this session, especially when we get together on Zoom and talk, is to you know, try to parse out the way these three movements are similar, are different, and what they tell us about artistic engagement with the public and actually trying to get the public involved. So without further ado, let's talk about Dada. So uh, if you've never studied Dada before, uh, one of the first, th first things you, you need to realize about Dada is that it was very international. Uh, so whereas futurism was nationalistic, uh, Dada was in, an inherently against any forms of nationalism, especially patriotism, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. So it was an international movement. It begins in Zurich. We'll talk about that in a moment very briefly. But there were Dada hubs in New York, in Berlin, in Cologne, in Hamburg, um, and of course in Paris. Um, so you had a, a pretty great international network of artists, and because of the war, which is a, a, a very important backdrop for Dada, as it was for the futurists, although in a different way. It's the war that, that led to a lot of uh, movement uh, and migration of these artists from, um, from, their, from their home countries. So keep that as a, a geopolitical backdrop. If there was a unifying strategy to Dada, if there was something that sort of tied them together, it was this fervent dislike of nationalism, and this fervent dislike of war. Um, so World War I, the backdrop, which is 1914 to 1918, this is one of the things that really fuels Dada, not only physically, like where they end up, uh, but also the, the, uh, it, it, it's, it's the fuel to their fire, uh, to their artistic fire. So in this way, they are, even if we're going to see some similarities at the level of strategy, especially with the public and public reaction, uh, Dada is diametrically opposed to futurism. Futurism, you'll remember, used the crowd um, in such a way that they wanted to engender violence that would be bellicose, that would be this sort of cleansing energy uh, from, from warlike sentiment. And they were, um, you'll remember, they were committed to Italian, uh, they would become committed to Italian fascism, and they're, they're committed to Italy as a war power, and they embraced the war as this cleansing event in history. Dada is completely against the war. They're, they're the total opposite of this. And so Dada, instead of trying to harness the energies of the crowd to create this uh, fight club kind of um, warmongering sort of, sort of aesthetic and mood, Dada instead was completely irreverent. Um, they used parody and they used mockery. They were, tra they were transgressive against the war, and also the class of people that they deemed to be most responsible for the war. So this would not only be the military class, and of course political leaders, but they would see the bourgeoisie, the very bourgeoisie that the Russian avant-garde and the October Revolution was, was revolting against, uh, they're going to see the bourgeoisie as complicit with the war, and with the nation, um, and complicit with the, the destruction that they're seeing all around them. In World War One, um, so we'll talk about this more in, in in a moment. So one of the things they used is parody, is mockery, and so Dada has often been associated with being completely absurd and nihilistic. One of the great uh, quotes you'll see this in paintings, you'll see this throughout manifestos and that sort of thing. Dada is anti-Dada. So this completely um, uh, flies in the face of the law of non-contradiction in logic. Uh, how can something be uh, Dada and anti-Dada all at once? It defies reason. But that's very much the point. So they embraced the absurdity, they embraced the irrational, um, and they were often 
for those reasons, deemed to be nihilistic. And by nihilism, usually what people mean uh, is, is uh, having no beliefs, um, just being completely irreverent and not, not being committed to anything. At least that's one version of, of nihilism. Um, there is a way in which we can, we can talk about Dada and we can interpret Dada actually as, as through this irrationality, through this embrace of the absurd, um, that this actually may open up into a philosophy in its own right, that they did have a, an ideological commitment, that they weren't completely nihilistic. And one of the ways that I try to show this when I teach Dada is to go a little forward to right after World War II, which is going to be even more destructive, more horrifying, um, and, and really represents a crack and a break in the history of, of humankind, um, especially because of, of the Holocaust and, and six million people being being liquidated in, in a genocide. Um, so World War II is, is, is a, an utter uh, catastrophe in the same way that for Dada, World War I was an utter catastrophe. So you have these two philosophers, the very, very uh, famous, Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer, German philosophers who are known as, um, in some ways, the founders, along with Walter Benjamin of, of the, the Frankfurt School of Critical Thought. And they read a book called Dialectic of Entitlement, and it's a very difficult book. Um, it's, it's, a, it's rewarding, it's a very important book, but it's a very difficult book. Um, and it starts with these lines. It starts with this line. In the most general sense of, of progressive thought, the Enlightenment has always aimed at liberating men from fear and establishing their sovereignty. Yet the fully enlightened earth radiates disaster triumphant. So these are very, very um, dramatic opening lines to this book. And in class, when, when we have discussion, I often try to get students to put these very fir famous first lines of this book into their own words. Um, and a lot comes out of it. And the way I put it in, in my own words, in everyday, everyday words, is that that first sentence, they're basically giving you a nutshell historical description of the Enlightenment, um, a cultural, intellectual movement that, that begins, and political, that begins in the 17th and 18th century. And the, the, the central core of the Enlightenment is for, for people to be li liberated from ignorance, to be liberated from superstition, and to be, to be delivered from, from dogma, and to understand that they are, um, they have autonomy, that they're, they're individuals, um, and they have certain rights. So the history of the rights of humankind come out of this history of enlightenment, in, in, at least in the West, right? And it's all tied up with histories of not only rights, but also science, the histories of technology um, and understanding how things work. Um, so the very beginnings of like Newtonian physics and that sort of thing, like understanding what the world really is, right? So science has been a great tool to demystify the world, to get rid of myths, some myths that are destructive, um, and superstitions, right? So this is what they're saying with that first sentence, like, um, this is how the Enlightenment has often been thought, that this liberated us, this allowed us to, to create all these incredible things, um, technology, industrial revolution, uh, progress in science, um, progress in all sorts of different things, right? And of course, who's going to knock um, the, the development of, of rights, the, the idea that, that um, all men are create, created equal? Um, and just the way the, our, our founding documents have it in this country, you notice they use the word men, right? So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's already a problem there. But this is often thought to be um, uh, a noble and great history, right? And yet, look at that second line. They say, yet the fully enlightened earth radiates disaster triumphant. So what do they mean by that? Um, Adorno and Horkheimer are some of the first uh, thinkers that we would describe as counter-enlightenment or anti-enlightenment, or at least they were trying to show that the enlightenment wasn't all um, um, happiness and progress um, and, and, and sovereignty and liberation, right? There is something about the enlightenment that also led to catastrophe. This is the core argument of this book. And at first you might think, well, that doesn't really make sense. But if I show you a few images, um, these are some incredibly consequential 
uh, human practices that come out of scientific breakthroughs and come out of technological innovation and our ability to harness the power of, of, of the earth and of our own technologies, right? These are things that come right out of the history of the Enlightenment for Adorno and Horkheimer. So the GIF here that you're seeing, clearly this is the atomic bomb or the hydrogen bomb, um, where for the first time man could create something through his or her own reason and technology that would in fact annihilate um, the whole planet. Um, or maybe not the planet, but all of life as we know it on the planet, right? So this is really consequential. This is a pretty clear-cut example of science and progress not necessarily leading to the benefit of mankind, um, or how we would say now, humankind, right? And not only humankind, non-humankind too. This would destroy more than humans, right? And speaking of non-humans, what you're seeing here, this is a large cattle feedlot in Texas by a contemporary artist. Um, this shows you one of the most destructive um, industrial practices that we have on, on um, going on today, uh, large-scale animal agriculture. So this is responsible for uh, species extinction, this is uh, responsible for biodiversity loss, um, this is responsible for deforestation, especially in the, the, in the Amazon, and this is, the, this is responsible for the emission of, of greenhouse gases. Um, especially methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. And it's really only the second, um, in, industrial animal agriculture is only is, is the second driver of global warming behind fossil fuels. And so here you're seeing the burning of fossil fuels, which is the, the, the first and, and major source of greenhouse gas and the driver of, of global warming. So like the hydrogen bomb, large-scale animal agriculture um, and, and fossil fuel industries these are man-made, human-made practices and technologies and organizations of, of nature um, that are leading, that's, that's leading to our own destruction, right? Um, that's leading to, um, right before our eyes, we're seeing California burning up, we're seeing Oregon uh, burning up, we're seeing Greenland uh, melt, um, and um, our, our, our planetary future is very much in doubt because of global warming. Um, which is largely anthropogenic. It's largely driven by, by humankind. And so Adorno and, and Horkheimer would not have been surprised by these developments, right? Uh, they would not have been just, um, surprised that science, technology, and our ability to, 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 to harness the energy of, of nature and subordinate nature, animals uh, and fossil fuels and so on and so forth, um, is backfiring um, and is leading to is leading to some serious problems, existential uh, and, and climate crises. And here we have um, a, fo um, a photograph uh, from the Vietnam War. And so this is another example of our ability to, to make these incredible things. Like we can fly, um, we can fly faster than the speed of sound. Um, uh, we have nanotechnologies. We have all these things. We have satellites up in up in orbit. Right? These are incredible things, and yet they have been able. They have been used as as killing machines, as as war machines. Right. Um, so Adorno's point is that Adorno and Horkheimer's point is that science technology doesn't always lead to liberating innovation. It can also lead to death and destruction. Right. So I've given you a quick a quick primer on this kind of counter enlightenment thinking, which is very important. Um, I think you, I think, I think you probably realize why it's so important to know about these things, and then uh, hopefully start to um, organize our lives in a way that 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 might help um, um, sort of put a damper on these destructive these destructive forces. But of course, it's only in, through a collective political will that we're gonna we're gonna solve these things. So um, I think you can all feel that we're 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 in the midst of this right now. Um, especially come November, which is going to be very consequential. And so take all those ideas and think that Adorno and Horkheimer, their, their disposition towards reason, towards progress, um, towards innovation and technology, Dada had, had these ideas in incipient form as artists. This is one of the reasons why they're such an interesting movement. And it's also why they're not necessarily just purely nihilistic and absurd. There was there was a there was a reason for their madness. There was a reason for their uh, uh, um, embracing absurdity, because think about it: World War One is happening, 
And all these things I've described to you, reason, technology, science, and then all the classes that benefit from these things, from the history of the Enlightenment, uh, which would be um, largely male, um, of course, totally European and, and white, um, and, and bourgeois um, and elite classes, right? And the military classes and the political classes, right? So Dada saw them as the enemy. They saw the butchery of World War I at the feet of, of these classes and at the feet of these ideas. They were one of the first to say, look, look at what enlightenment has brought us. It's brought us war, it's brought us millions dead, um, and it's, it's, um, it's total madness, right? So it's as if they're saying that reason can, can go overboard and become mad um, and destructive and, and, and catastrophic. And so then it makes sense that they would get together um, as a group, as a group of artists who are all very different from each other. And you'll notice from the reading that there, 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 there would always be splinter, splinterings. There would always be factions. But in Zurich in 1917, they would get together in Switzerland. Zurich is not uh, coincidental. Uh, Zurich was in Switzerland, which was neutral during the war. So this was a way to escape the war. Um, funny enough, I think I told you this in the Russian Revolution lecture, but Lenin was, w had, had to escape Russia briefly, and he lived just down the street uh, from where the Dadaists were, um, were mucking things up. And so they were in, in Zurich, and here already we get to some participatory, um, socially engaged themes. Because they didn't go and then start uh, painting in isolation or uh, making sculptures in isolation or what have you. They set up um, uh, the Cabaret of Voltaire, which was in a cafe, and it's still there. They kind of made it um, this, this meeting place where the public could come, um, a little bit like, you know, just like a soiree of, of intellectuals and artists and that so, so on and so forth. And they would drink, they would recite poetry, they would recite manifestos, they would show work. Um, and it was just this carnivalesque sort of atmosphere, um, all based on types of work that would embrace chance, that would embrace absurdity, that would embrace contradiction, that would embrace uh, being completely irrational and irreverent. And so now you see why if they embrace all these things, it wasn't just to be silly and nihilistic. They were doing it to do the opposite of, of, of reason, of technology, of bourgeois seriousness that they saw as responsible for the war, right? Um, so now you see, if you see someone like Marcel Janko in his mask, they would wear masks, they would have these incredible um, um, nights where they would they would drink. I'm sure there were, there was there were, there was uh, drugs involved, like opium and that sort of stuff, um, and they would have a, a wild time. Um, or someone like Hugo Boss, who was uh, by and large a poet, but he sort of headed. He was one of the the heads along with Tritz and Sara of, of Zurich Dada. There he is dressed up as uh, in his magical bishop costume and he's reciting um, his, his poem, uh, Karawane, which is a poem of completely made up words. So you can't get further away from reason and, um, and sort of like, you know, like seriousness of, of, of the, the tradition of bourgeois poetry or what have you, uh, than to write poems and poetry that's just pure nonsense, pure sounds, right? Um, so this gives you an idea of what, what, what Dada was like. And already in Zurich, they were engaging the public by, by basically setting up a Dada cabaret, like a, a cafe, the, the, the cabaret Voltaire. Then uh, we get to our, our class and what Bishop is preoccupied with in this part of the, um, of the chapter of the historical avant-garde precedents. We get to Dada in Paris. So the war ends in 1918. And some of the artists that were part of Zurich Dada would end up going, some go to New York, some go to Berlin, um, and then some, like Tristan Sara, go to Paris. Um, and he, along with Breton, who is our big, probably our big figure for today, because um, 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 he's talked about quite a bit in, in, in this chapter, but it wasn't only him, people like Aragon, Apollinaire, um, again, Tristan Sara, um, and Picabia, who's a real treat. Picabia is, is kind of amazing. Um, they would get together, um, and they continued on with this tradition of, 
of irreverence and, and parody um, and embracing absurdity, but, but in Paris. And in a way that was a little more organized than, the, than Zurich. So they had um, soirees, um, but not in, not so much in cafes, although they would you know have things in cafes. Uh, they would have things in theater halls, right? So they would have these fest Dada festivals, these these evenings with with Dada. Um, so here's a flyer for one of the most famous ones. This is at the, this was at the Salle Gavou, um, and you see it sort of gives you everything that you're gonna um, that you're gonna have um, during their soiree. And what's amazing, what's amazing about Tata is that they would sometimes advertise things that they wouldn't fall, follow through on. The most notorious one was was in, when they said that Charlie Chaplin would show up, um, and it, does, it didn't get more famous and big as Charlie Chaplin at that time. Uh, he was already a really huge, important filmmaker. Um, so you can imagine how disappointed the public was when, when Chaplin does not show up. So they would do these sort of things. Um, they would they would recite poetry, poetry that wouldn't really make any sense. There would be music. Um, often the music would be based just on chance, like someone sitting on a piano, and just randomly playing some notes. Right. Um, sometimes they would just recite the news or political manifestos. Um, uh, they would do all sorts of things. And this is this was one of them. So this is the Sal Gavo that happened in, on May 26, 1920. Um, so here you see there's Breton, there's Tristan Sara. Um, I think this is Aragon, Aragon, and I can't read the, the rest. But they're dressed up in these amazing like tall hats. They're reciting poetry. Um, again, there would be there would be music. Um, and at this point. Uh, by May 26, 1920, already the, the audience was a little bit in the know. So before this, uh, this wasn't the first Dada festival. They would, in the earliest Dada festivals, the crowd was really perplexed. Um, and they, were, they even seemed bored. Um, and, and there's an interesting way in which Dada tried to use boredom um, in these spectacles as a counter spectacle. That, that, that's interesting to talk about. This is a very different context from Italian futurism, who are trying to harness war, and certainly different from the uh, the mass spectacles of the Bolsheviks, who are trying to harness collective energy, like serious political um, political energies towards a collective future. Right here, we're in Paris, um, the the city of lights, and the city where commodity culture and the spectacle um, and consumerism really is already taking hold in the early 1920s. And so there's something kind of radical and subversive about a group of artists getting up there and kind of, and just being boring and boring the audience, um, which is very different from um, the state of excitation that we're always in, um, even more so today in consumer culture and commodity visual culture, where as everything is about lulling you into pleasure, into buying things, um, into not really thinking that deeply, um, and, and, and all these things that we know are um, are, are not so great about um, about uh, uh, Western cultures that are based on on liberal consumerism, right? Um, there are all all sorts of dead ends there, and so it's interesting. Dada is already trying to bore people, um, um, or, or 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 mystify them, or or make them make them think by by. Um, by presenting them some with something with, with, that's not easy, and so this is really interesting. So something hopefully we'll talk about when, when we get together. But by, we get, by the time we get to the Salle Gavo and the the public manifestations after that, the, the the audience, the Parisian audiences, many of whom are these upper class bourgeois, they know, uh, and then they start to get in on it, and they start to yell, they start to throw things, and it starts to become uh, quite similar to those futurist serratas. Uh, where the public would would get involved, and you had um, violent confrontations between the artists and the and the and the crowd, and the crowd the crowd itself would become part of the work. Right? This is one of the important precedents for participatory participatory practices. But whereas the futurists found found this to be a success because they're trying to harness this energy and they loved it if the the the, the crowd got triggered and violent. For Dada, maybe not so much. Um, and in fact, if you read Artificial Hells that, that Breton writes, it's his retrospective take on the Dada events before he becomes, he found surrealism. Um, he's aware of the fact that once 
the audience, once the public is expecting shock and enjoys shock, then shock as an aesthetic tactic doesn't work anymore. That it's over, right? Um, that, it, that it simply is something that's going to be folded into and co-opted by bourgeois society and by the spectacle itself, right? So this is a very important idea that runs throughout the 20th century when it comes to avant-garde practices that try to jolt and try to uh, discomfort the public. If this jolting and discomfort simply becomes a, a form of entertainment, well, it's over, right? Um, it's not doing anything anymore, right? So Breton's really uh, prescient about this. Like he, he's, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that, that, that he realized this as early as the, um, the, uh, the, night, the early 1920s. And there were some other things that the Dadaists did. Let's go through them um, somewhat more quickly here so that we don't go too too far over in this in this video. Um, but whereas most of these 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 um, Dada festivals and instigations in theaters happened in, you know, these were these were upper crust bourgeois upper middle class places. Um, there were there were a couple moments where they attempted to engage the working class, les ouvriers. Um, and one of these was at the at l'Université Populaire de Faubourg uh, Saint Antoine in in, um, in February 1920, where they actually went out and tried to explain Dada uh, to workers, right? And I, I, here I come back to if you'll remember that that play that Eisenstein puts on that was written by um, 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 Tretyakov uh, at the gas works, right? Where the workers there, the, the, the play was about the workers, but the workers were just like, uh, what are you guys doing here? Like, this is just, you're just getting in the way, right? It was a similar thing here. Um, it was very hard for Dada to explain Dada, to explain how it would be in some ways useful um, as a strategy of resistance for this working class who are probably just trying to get by um, and they're not interested in these crazy artists, right? So there's a misconnect there, a miscommunication. Um, and we then, and then we, we wonder how much Dada can actually get politically involved, right? Um, how, can a, how can a movement that's so irreverent and parodic and, and embraces absurdity, how can it in some ways align with the working class politics? Um, this is this is a serious problem, and something Breton will also realize, um, which he'll try to address when when he founds surrealism, which will be much more engaged with, <clears throat> let's say the <clears throat> the working class plight, <coughs> excuse me, and the and the communist party. So this is a telling moment here where they're trying to engage the working class, and it didn't work so well. But there were other strategies that were socially engaged and, and, and if not uh, downright participatory. And one would be a call in the uh, littérature, which was the, the, the journal arm of Dada at the time in, in Paris. So there was a call for uh, an anonymous mural, a public mural. And they, 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 it's almost like a... Um, a Craigslist ad or something like that today, where they would see they would see people uh, like um, deface posters or create murals, like like today's graffiti artists, right? Um, who are anonymous, right? We don't know who these people are. So who, who is this person? Um, I, in the subway, I used to like looking at the ads where people had torn and then made like funny, you know, through the tearings of the posters, like usually movie posters, they would sort of make funny. Um, funny juxtapositions where they would write things, right? Uh, this is exactly what they were doing here. They saw, you know, who is the anonymous individual who keeps writing no on posters? Who is the person who keeps signing posters with this name? Um, um, or in, in, in the bathroom? Um, I'm sure you've all been in a public bathroom, in a coffee shop or something like that, and then you, there's a plenty to read on the walls. Um, often, you know, like a... Um, not, not the highest level writing, but uh, sometimes it can be funny. Um, or the artist who draws on toothpaste ads, right? So they saw these anonymous people doing things in the city, and then they said, let's get these people together um, and remain anonymous, but make this sort of collective work as, as a poster. So that's definitely a type of socially engaged, if not participatory work. And another thing um, that Breton brings here is just conceiving the city almost like as a theater. Um, which is a, which is a breakdown of of artist and audience in some ways, right? Or the space of the theater as the place where the the artwork happens, and then the public and the city, where it's just 
um, incidental or outside the space of, of creation. Breton had a practice of wandering in the streets, um, almost as a almost as a work of art, um, where he would be attentive to people, to places. Um, and if you've ever been to Paris, Paris is probably one of the best cities just to to, to wander and get lost in. Uh, it's it's very beautiful, and there are all sorts of different places to see. And um, so, simply wandering um, and using the city as as a, almost like a theatrical place to just look at. Uh, and to make observations. This is something that was important for Breton, and it's a precursor of the situation in International um, and their technique of the dérive, which we're going to talk about um, in the coming in the coming weeks. Um, so that's an interesting, another inter interesting example of. This is really not participatory technically, but it is certainly is socially engaged to conceive of the city as uh, as a, as, a, as a work of art that you can walk through and make some observations. Um, and he he um, immortalizes these some of these walks in his famous books, uh, so especially Nadja, um, where you get you get uh, passages in that book where he's walking around Paris and telling you about it and telling you about the people he's seen. The works that are far more, let's say, within the scope of participatory art would be the excursions um, that were planned, but there was really only one, which was the excursion to Saint-Julien-le-Pauvre, a not really well-known Gothic church in a not really well-known, um, or frequented part of Paris. Um, and it was, it was sort of, um, meant to be like a, um, how do you, how do you put it? Like a, like a, a sort of like a parodic, a parody of the tour guide. Um, so imagine going on a tour guide where the, the, the person takes you to like this really unimportant place <laughs> in, in, in Paris and you're wondering why are we not at the Tour Eiffel, why, why, why aren't we at the Notre Dame, why are we not at Sacre-Cœur, like why, why aren't we at like all the, the, the big touristic sites, why are we here, right? Um, and uh, it's very Dada, right? Uh, and here he actually includes the public, like the public, think of this work almost like as a tour guide. And there's, there are famous photographs. Here's Breton reading um, something he prepared about uh, this, uh, this excursion, and this is the public. Unfortunately, it was like a dreary rainy day, so not everything they had planned um, um, actually happened. Uh, but it's, still, it's an interesting mode of public engagement and certainly participatory since they took the, these artists took the, the public with them right so I won't talk too much more about this one because this is going to be one of the one of the works um, one of the events that were that that are going to be presented on um, in our in our zoom session um, as will this one um, and I won't talk about this one uh, really at all because this is this is along with um, uh, the excursion to Saint Julien le pauvre the mock trial of Maurice Barré um, on May 13th, 1921, is, uh, is, is a key event uh, in this participatory work. So I won't really say much about it um, because we're going to go through it in depth when we get together um, um, in, in, our, in, our, um, in our meeting this week. So I'll just leave you with this image, and I look forward to the, the presenters getting into the, the nitty-gritty of what this was all about. Um, it really sort of concludes... The, the Dada season for that year, um, and really maybe is the 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 end event of, of Dada in Paris. And so, just one takeaway uh, as as we end, and um, we'll open on we'll open up to some some discussion, is to think about artificial hells. This this um, text that Breton wrote, um, which incidentally I put on the website for the presenters, but if anybody else wants to read it, uh, it's not that long, uh, and. It's a, it's a nice primary document to read. And I think I, I signposted this at the beginning of this lecture. One of the major points that he makes in this is he's really worried. Um, he says, what if shock no longer shocks? Um, what if this is no longer a strategy? What if this transgressive, parodic, nihilistic um, engagement with the public just gets, just turns into uh, entertainment, entertainment value? Um, and it's just shocking for shock's sake, right? This is what he meant by artificial hell, incidentally. Um, artificial hell, um, I think you can think of it, I mean, you might have your own take, because he's obviously, Breton's a writer and somewhat poetic, but by artificial hell, I think he, you, can, you can kind of say these are just artificial shocks, like people aren't really in hell, this is artificial, right? this is not really 
uh, transgressive or um, or constructive through destruction, um, which is what Dada would, would, would in some ways be committed to, right? So already in this text, he's pushing back and he's, he's it's almost a eulogy for Paris Dada. Um, so this comes from the Wit Witkowski um, essay Dada Breton, uh, which is good. Um, this is what he meant by artificial hells in which the public becomes inured to shock. Inured means like you've seen it so much that it no longer really affects you, right? That's what inurement means. Becomes inured to shock and is energized by rudeness, vulgarity, and provocation, and develops a taste for shouting back, egging performers, and further out outrageous activities, right? So this would be ideal for the futurists. This is what the futurists wanted. Um, but for Breton, he sees that this is a dead end. Um, and this is just going to become another spectacle in Paris, and Dada will simply become a fashionable trend. Um, and something risky that the bourgeoisie can partake in. And so it, it'll lose its, it's lost its edge. Um, and so one of the things I'll leave you with is, is again, I, I think for this class, the important thing is to, is to understand the differences and to compare the way in which the futurist used the public with the way the Russian avant-garde used the public during the October Revolution and, and afterwards in the way that uh, Dada used the public in Paris. Each one has three distinct political ideologies. Each one has a distinct geopolitical setting, uh, which conditions their, their, their participatory strategies. So this is one of the things we'll want to talk about um, and that um, hopefully you can, you can sort of address and try to work through um, with patience and rigor in the, in the comment section. Um, if that's if this is part of the discussion, that, that that would be interesting to you. Understanding why these three are the three important precedents um, that's offered up to us in, in Bishop's book. Okay. Um, see you all. See you all next time. That's enough for this uh, for for Dada Paris. Take care.